Hey everybody, this is Feng Zhu and welcome to this week's Design Cinema. This is um, episode 57, uh, marker sketching techniques, or I guess digital marker sketching techniques, as well as a uh, quick review on the uh, Wacom Cintiq. So the couple of topics I'll talk about, uh, which I just mentioned, one is the uh, going to be a quick my review, a mini review of the uh, Cintiq. Uh, another one is the you know this whole technique you're watching right now. I'll try to cover some topics about design, and I'll finish up with some questions that I saw on the last video, uh, mostly regarding kind of lifestyle balance, um, you know, maybe salaries and those kind of things. So I'll try to get to those at the end of this video. Uh, but let's start with this uh, whole technique of markers. What you see me doing is actually a technique uh, I used to use back in the days. Um, I learned about markers back in about mid 90s, so about 95, 96 when I was in school. And uh, I prefer the brand Prisma. Uh, you can also use Colbic and a bunch of other kind of brands out there. But my personal choice was the cool gray Prismas. And uh, I'll use it in the odd numbers. So one, three, five, seven, nine and of course black and that gives you a nice uh, shift in the values uh, so and this technique was something that uh, I used for almost 10 years um, I stopped going digital around 2003 so up to that point I used to do this which was to take a piece of copy paper uh, like what you see here and take about a 10% marker and just draw with the marker now the only advantage, the uh, well, one of the main advantages of working in digital, is that you can erase the marker. But even in um, in traditional mediums, uh, when you make mistakes, the one percent or ten percent marker, uh, by the time it's kind of dry, you could barely see it. Uh, but you could definitely make it out on your own. And what this does is gives you a couple of. of uh, uh, ways to uh, balance your work. One is that you can make mistakes on a paper and it doesn't show up because remember traditional media is very, very easy to make mistakes. Um, and you, by using this technique, you can kind of minimize that because if you make any kind of lines that doesn't look good and stuff like that, uh, it won't show up. Another one is building confidence. Uh, when you start with a blank piece of paper, like in this case, a big white sheet here, it's very, very intimidating, right? Because you're like, oh man, this is a nice piece of paper. I'm going to mess it up. And you start to uh, second guess yourself and maybe that will make you do worse work. By having a marker, having something on the page, it cuts that risk down because you already got something on the page, it's kind of loose, uh, it's, it's suggestive, so it builds your confidence and by the time you get to line work, you already you know, essentially put down most of the forms on paper, uh, which I'm doing now. So once the marker technique is down, you have a, you know, of course, when you're doing the markers, you can't forget the things like fundamentals, like perspective in this case is very, very vital and that comes from the understanding of uh, perspective in essays. Um, but anyways, even when I'm doing the marker, that stuff is still in there. But when I do the line work that is then um, cleaned up. It's it's uh, more precise. You can see me actually putting a couple of perspective guidelines uh, in this drawing. So I want to do this technique to show you guys because line drawing is one of those kind of, uh, in my opinion, a, a kind of a rare thing to see these days. Uh, a lot of the portfolios that we review for uh, hiring other artists, for example, are pretty much all digital paintings these days, a lot of production paintings. Um, and sometimes, especially for junior artists, it's hard to gauge what, uh, what level they are with their kind of design and drawing abilities when you're looking at only digital paintings because digital paintings there are you know even in my own videos you can see that there's numerous numerous ways to get to the result and some of those results or uh, techniques could actually hide your abilities for example you can start with a photo that's you know 80 percent there and you just do the 20 percent finish it and also we don't know how long it takes you um, so it's very deceiving sometimes right for line drawing however it's very very hard to you know, uh, I guess the best way to put it is cheat your line work. Uh, even if you trace it on top of 3D, what happens is your line work will show your confidence and how long you've been drawing. You just cannot fake that kind of stuff with line drawing. It's very, very hard to get good line flow if you haven't drawn a lot. Uh, so that comes from experience and many, many years of drawing. So for us professionals, when we look at someone's drawing, uh, even from a single sketch, uh, within a few seconds, you could know that this guy's probably been drawing a lot or this is a student drawing but, uh, because the line work gives away so much of it. Uh, for example, if you look at someone like Frank Fazetta, you know, these master uh, artists, uh, their single little sketch uh, that took probably maybe 30 seconds or maybe a minute for them to draw is filled with about 20, 30 years of experience within it. And you could totally get that from the line drawing. So oftentimes what we do is when we see a good portfolio is that we ask the designer to uh, send us their sketchbook so we could see their uh, kind of like the true core abilities, right? especially for jobs that require these type of uh, uh, techniques in which uh, you do the digital painting to establish the world, but then you got to get down to the nitty gritty, the so and you know the so called kind of boring things uh, that are very very hard because digital painting you can indicate all sorts of stuff, um, you know uh, things like uh, technologies and and machinery you could just kind of uh, wiggle whatever details in it and make it look kind of good, which is the point of uh, early phase digital painting. Uh, but once the clients or if you're working in in-house, once that design is proved, well, someone has to go in there and draw it all nicely like these. Um, 
so it's a technique that's definitely required for a, a lot of the jobs out there, especially in the video game uh, sectors. So anyways, back to the technique. So once the marker sketch is done, now I just see me um, inking this whole thing out. And I'm going to, this process is going to repeat about five times. So um, don't worry if I, you know, I'm kind of going over the, uh, this drawing here by talking about something else. So whenever I pick up something important, I'll let you guys know. So uh, all the rules of line weight is being applied here, such as line uh, weight itself, uh, you know, how heavy to put a line certain, uh, in certain places. And I used to do this with a pen called the uh, Pilot High Tech C. Uh, they come in, uh, I think, three different, uh, or maybe even four different kind of thickness. Uh, it was a 0.3 that I used to do the drawings, a 0.5 for the inking. I believe there was a 0.7 as well uh, for the line weight. Um, in digital, however, you could kind of just use a single brush to do that. Uh, I'm using a default brush. This brush actually came with Photoshop CS6. I believe it's called a calligraphy brush or something like that. It looks like calligraphy. It's built at a 45 degree angle, so it's quite neat. But unfortunately, because it's at a 45, uh, when you go in one direction, the line will be thick. When you go in the other direction, it will be thin. So you see me spinning the canvas constantly to get that thick and thin going uh, whenever I need that uh, to hit a particular line. Um, so let me talk about the Cintiq real quick. Let's review that real quick. So I just myself a 24 uh, inch I guess HD Cintiq now I did not get the touch because they don't even have it here in Singapore unfortunately I want to get it but they just don't have it so I just got it whatever is uh, best in a line which is a 24 inch Cintiq um, I only had it for one week right now and this drawing is, uh, you see here is being done on it so it's kind of like a good way to uh, to break in the system I say um, I still have mixed reviews on it. I'm not sure if I'm sold 100% on it, but it is definitely extremely beneficial for drawing, like what you see here. Uh, because the Cintiq allows you to see one-on-one -on -one comparison. You know, like when you put the line uh, and you want to see where the next line goes, you can actually compare that on the screen versus uh, the t traditional way you have to kind of see it in your mind, right? Because you can't physically see the uh, distance between your fingers. So that gives you a huge advantage when you're doing drawings, um, when you, especially when you're doing details like what I'm doing here. Like whatever you imagine to go on that, piece of equipment, you could just draw it. Uh, I don't know if that's a little hard to explain, I guess. I mean, it's the same thing when you're doing uh, wake up to the screen, but there's a certain kind of uh, analog feeling when you can just see the shape and your hands and the pen touching, and you could then make the details or whatever line weight uh, hit each other. Uh, so that's a great help. Uh, the other one is the kind of the traditional way of thinking again. You know, I, I, when I first started using the Cintiq, it brought back memories of when I used to draw on paper. Uh, you almost rely on the same kind of techniques. You know, you kind of spin your head, you spin your hand a little bit. Uh, whereas the Wacom, I always spin the canvas or I kind of move my wrist over to hit certain lines. On the Cintiq, you can use the same movements uh, as you did on the paper. So. Now, when it comes to digital painting, which I haven't done here, I'm still not sold 100% because digital painting, I often do my paintings very, very small. They're like tiny, and you've probably seen in some of my design system as well. So the Cintiq is a one-to-one -one thing. I mean, you can shrink your image down, but the ideal is to be working at a kind of like a one-to-one -one, uh, or even zoomed in level. So for digital painting, when you shrink it down, it makes the movement across the screen quite awkward uh, with your hands. Like you're moving, making these kind of micro movement, and it's still one-to-one. -one. Versus on the um, regular Wacom tablet, it's, uh, it's exaggerated, right? Like a one inch move uh, on the screen will become like the entire screen. So it's sort of like that on the Cintiq, but it doesn't feel the same, at least to me uh, right now. But for drawing, definitely a huge advantage. So uh, I did reprogram my buttons on the Cintiq. So it does what I need to do. One of them is flipping the screen. Uh, I think the other one, what I did was, uh, I think pick certain kind of tools, uh, such as the F key that cycle through screens. Um, the touch does not have, I mean, I don't have the touch version. If you have the touch version, I imagine you could press the keyboards and stuff um, directly on the screen. But Wacom does let you have this little keyboard that pops up uh, by pressing a button, like kind of like a virtual keyboard. Now, I didn't use it in this video. I just used my keyboard uh, that's right underneath the screen. So overall, yeah, for sketching is great tool. Um, however, if you're just starting out, I don't think it's something I recommend because it is extremely expensive. Um, I don't know how much this unit cost. I think it's cost about maybe 3500 something like that USD so that's a that's a sizable chunk of money to be investing uh, especially if you haven't done this kind of stuff before or you're not a not, not a full-on professional and not making money to buy it so I recommend just get it into us uh, three or four or five uh, any of those and practice with that first this tool is just a tool it's not gonna help you get better it's not gonna help you draw better uh, it's actually I think for professionals it's it's good uh, for beginners I think it can actually hurt you because you'd be frustrated with the, some of his limitations um, 
yeah, for that kind of money, you should probably just buy a uh, expensive laptop or something like that, or a desktop and a nice Wacom. Um, and then once you start getting into this business and making good money, and if you have the spare change, you know, I consider this almost like an experimentation thing that I bought. It's not something I need to absolutely use in my daily job. So if you're in that situation, then I recommend it. But uh, if cash is tight, then hold back. So all right, let me go back to um, the technique itself again. So here I am uh, inking again. This whole process here took about, this has been sped up, but the whole process in real time took about two, about roughly three hours. So I got five drawings, so that breaks down to about what, about 35 minutes each, something like that. Um, now for me, I've been drawing for a while. This will used to be a lot slower. Line drawing is the, uh, at least these kind of tighter-ish line drawings, is probably the most time consuming process uh, in the production pipeline, digital painting being the fastest. In three hours, I could probably complete the entire digital painting. Uh, line drawings because you can't cheat. Again, it goes back to raw technique, right? Every single line you gotta you gotta put your wrist down to uh, wake them or, or pen or paper and put it down. So it's it's quite time consuming. So you have to have a lot of patience when it comes to line drawing. Uh, something we try to teach our students here to do because you always want to you know finish it up and get to the result. But in line drawing, you have to kind of imagine the result already there, and you just have to take your time and slowly carve across the canvas and get the thing drawn out. Right? It's very easy to run out of steam if you're not patient. Uh, because, if, for example, in this case, if you ink the cockpit and it took you, uh, say, you haven't been doing this for a long, long time, and the cockpit takes you maybe 20 minutes to ink, you just do the math on that. The whole thing is going to take you three hours just to ink it. You know, then you got you know four more drawings on top of that. So you're like, my goodness, man, it's gonna take me 10, 12, 13 hours just to finish the line line art. And that's 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 uh, however that's reality. So that's what I used to do when I um, used to work in the companies. That you do a quick math on yourself, and it's nine o'clock in the morning. You're like, man, I'm not gonna be done with this till you know late seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, and you have to just live through that because the more you do this kind of stuff, the faster you get. So now these drawings are taking me only about you know 35 minutes, which is pretty quick, I think, for a line drawing. Um, but part of that speed, you know, just in case my clients are watching this and go, hey man, how come you don't draw that fast for my drawings? It's because these have no design specs. Um, you know, they're just kind of whatever goes. I don't have to follow any kind of design spec. Uh, when a client's actually giving you something to follow, for example, like you must do this, you must take off this way, you must fly in this direction, blah, blah, blah. Then you can no longer freeform design like what I'm doing here. So it dramatically slows the time down because you actually have to figure how things work uh, in terms of meeting the client's uh, uh, specs. So uh, hopefully my clients are not watching right now going, dude, man, you, you, you should be giving me uh, five drawings every two hours hours or something like that so um, all right so back to uh, let me see what else technical stuff to talk about so line drawing again very good to have your portfolio if you are a, especially a student looking for work because with line drawing we could uh, uh, put you to a variety of work for example you could come in as a junior artist and take digital paintings the ones you know we uh, kind of gloss over a bunch of uh, suggested details or well, you could take those kind of uh, designs and uh, structures that we put in the paintings and detail out for us as a line drawing and that's a pretty uh, good job to have and there's a lot of those kind of positions currently open uh, even on the project I'm on right now we could definitely use that type of uh, artists uh, to help us uh, do that because you want to park your, uh, you know, so-called expensive artist on the uh, big things, you know, the design of, of the world and the visualization of the entire project. You want those guys, experienced guys on that. And you want to put the junior artists tend to be on the inking side, you know, the stuff that takes a lot of time um, that you don't want your expensive artist to be doing. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's a good skill to have because digital painting, especially those kind of uh, speed painting things, um, they're just pretty tricky for us to evaluate your skills uh, because there's a lot of guys out there with it, but we just don't know how good you are in a real production pipeline scenario in which we ask you to, hey, detail this out, give us a 360, give us a back view, give us a front three quarter. Can you do it? Or is that digital painting, speed paint a lucky result of you know uh, happy accidents as I did in my previous videos right you get these designs almost uh, instantaneously but in a uh, real pipeline you're gonna have a lot of people giving you all sorts of feedback and you have to take that feedback and then transform it into a viable design so those are things that we often don't see in speed paintings um, but in a tighter painting of course we get that but uh, the majority of portfolios we get are always these kind of quick 20 minute 30 minute looking paintings with a lot of suggestive values and things like that and it could be kind of neat uh, but design in general if you break it down to say just a line drawing it's you know it's quite light in that terms so practicing line drawings it's a skill that every studio would definitely like and all art directors I don't think there's any art directors out there who do not appreciate uh, beautiful line drawings it is a one of those kind of core skills that truly proves your um, skill level so 
All right, let me see. Uh, we still got. I, I make this video about thirty minutes, so we could cover a bunch of topics. Um, sorry, I'm speaking fast. I'm just trying to uh, you know get through as much things as I possibly can. Oh, which reminds me, we do have that workshop coming up in uh, mid November or something like that. Um, so if you guys want to come to that, we still have some seats available. Go to our website fcdschool.com and you can find the details on that. So we got my buddy uh, Neville Page coming, who designed a bunch of films uh, such as Prometheus and uh, those kind of uh, really Scott films coming along. And we have Ben uh, that I'm working with currently on a project and he's very very good with technical as well as creature design so those two will be coming by in Singapore showing us how they uh, how they do the design work and um, I personally want to get into that um, stuff myself because um, I haven't uh, used ZBrush much in my design flow so I want to learn it from these guys and see how they do their work so yeah that's so that's coming in November so you know if you're around Singapore or something like that I highly recommend you guys to check it out it's gonna be a very very uh, informative workshop it's pretty long it's an all-day thing for both speakers or so one day each for each of these guys so you're definitely going to walk away with a lot of uh, information okay so enough plugging my uh, my thing here let's get back to uh, uh, some of the questions on YouTube okay I want to cover the lifestyle thing as this um, drawing kind of take care of yourself the uh, there are some questions on how do you balance your life you know it seems like from what I do I'm always working 24 hours a day but that's not the case I actually just work from about I get to work about 10 o'clock in the morning and I get off around 7 o'clock sometimes 6 o'clock I stop working and that's it I don't work anything beyond that on the weekends I don't do any work when I go home I don't do any work I only work when I'm in the studio um, that's something I gave myself to do a while back because you have to have a balance if you do this all the time you're gonna get burned out and you're gonna you're not gonna like what you do for a living for me I love to design so I don't want to burn myself out. I want to be able to, um, you know, come in every day and be excited about what I do. So, to way to balance that, I, I guess one of the advantage I have is to. I've uh, been in this industry for a long time, so drawing, the speed of it becomes pretty quick. Um, so I'm not bogged down by taking forever on a painting or a drawing. So that's a huge advantage you have. Unfortunately, that's something that you cannot just build up from day one. That does take, I think, maybe at least five years or so to get pretty comfortable with your working speed in which you can start um, accurately judging how long something takes you. So if your client gives you, say, um, uh, five of these drawings, well, I could probably get them all done in one day. You know, that's under a real design situation. So then you can kind of time your day out and give your clients a appropriate bidding saying, hey, yeah, five drawings a day, they're probably cool with it. And then all you got to do is work in a day and you make sure that you stay within your hours. So that's the way I balance my life is, you know, never kind of uh, over promise, right? One of the secrets of life is under under promise everything and over deliver, right? That's that's true for everything. So we're lower expectations for everybody and then overly um, uh, exceed that when you actually deliver. So when you do that, you don't put that much pressure on yourself because if you know, let's let's pretend it's the opposite. And I told my clients, oh yeah, in a single day, I'll give you 20 of these drawings at this quality. I mean, that is impossible to meet. And the clients, of course, will be really, really happy to get that. But you're going to be killing yourself getting that kind of stuff presented to them. And you're going to basically be working 24 hours a day and not enjoy what you're doing. This kind of stuff is very fun. You know, at the end of the day, it's very fun. But if you're going to kill yourself doing it, then no, it doesn't become very fun. So in the beginning of my career, the first um, maybe two three years some some of those days are pretty rough because you you you're competing with professionals so you cannot underbid in terms of the output you still got to say oh yeah if that professional is doing uh, five drawings a day and i could do five drawings but at that time i could probably only do two so the only way to make up for that is to tell the clients i did five in a day but i actually work uh, way more than a day maybe um 16 hours or something like that to do the five drawings you know work way into the middle of the night about four or five in the morning and then turn it in at 9 a.m and get about four hours sleep um, but these days i could balance out pretty well so so the good thing is you know if you do this enough you will definitely find a balance in your life and when i go home i don't do anything remotely close to work um what i usually do is go to the go to the beach and uh, go work out i have a dog that i take running so i'm out usually about two hours doing uh, weights and uh, body lifting and all sorts of stuff to keep yourself healthy um and then when i come home uh, i don't watch any tv so i guess that's another good thing um i kind of got bored of tv and back in like early 2000 there's nothing good on essentially so uh, i spend the time kind of researching things maybe read news articles i watch a lot of uh, uh, youtube videos that are you know not not the junky videos but the stuff that's quite informative you know like science debates and uh, a lot of bbc things uh, you know these kind of things that stimulates the imagination so that's what i do at home um, and then on the weekends i don't do any of this stuff either you know i go out with my wife to the park uh, you know we go to uh, go check out new restaurants and things like that live a very very normal life it's definitely not a i don't live a i guess the stereotypical artist life you know where i go home and drawing and then i go to a cafe and i draw and then on the weekends i hang i hang out a bunch of guys and draw i don't do that i treat my job 
just like any other job. You know, when I go home, I don't do any of it. It's not a it's not a lifestyle for me, I guess, in a way. But that's different for everybody because I do know very good concept artists that do live that kind of way. You know, like their whole life is around uh, art and drawing. Uh, but I think I'm just, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the word is, but I think I've been doing this for too long uh, to do that in my life. I got other things in my life to enjoy besides just doing concept art. So yeah, you can live a, a pretty good life doing this kind of stuff. Um, and quite low stressed. So, but definitely you need to have a balance. And the other question that came up a lot. Um, oh, let me let me cut myself short here. And talk about this thing I'm doing here. You can see on the screen I'm drawing a, a cannon, a gun. Uh, I ended up deleting this because this is something that we don't preach too much here at school to do weaponized things. Because in my opinion, if you can make a design look good without sticking a big barrel or a big uh, cannon on it, then your design is probably pretty viable. Uh, if you have to rely on, for example, something that uh, requires you to put a gun on it, then that's much, much easier to pull off. So anyways, uh, let me see here what else that we want to talk about here. So yeah, if, if you can avoid weapon designs, because we don't allow that in our school unless the project absolutely needs it. Um, for example, you know, if you're doing a project that... Oh, I'm back. Sorry about that. I had a quick glitch in my um, software here that the uh, screen, you know, those screens save everything. Throw my screen off so I couldn't see anything for a little bit. I had to pause the video. Uh, anyways, what was I saying here? Um, something about uh, doing weapons, right? Because, uh, yeah, that's something that we don't let our students here to do because we want their designs to kind of stay, uh, you know, nice and uh, readable without having some kind of barrel or um, guns on it because it's quite easy to do. I mean, you could take a car and just stick guns on the uh, on the top or uh, missiles on the side or something. It'll have very cool read to it because that has to do with the, the whole visual library thing that we talk about these kind of preconceptions that humans have with weapons, uh, especially boys, right? If you have weapons on something, it just looks cool. So when you stick weapons on something, it automatically gives you this kind of cool thing without you actually have to do too much design work on top of it. So yeah, so if your design could survive without the use of a weapon, then it's better. So that's why I chose not to uh, put the gun or weaponize these vehicles. So now all of these could be turned to military. I mean, again, by sticking weapons and missiles on them, uh, they could actually be used for military. But I designed these to be kind of more civilian, you know, some kind of vehicle that could be in this kind of weird post uh, post pop political uh, kind of world. So, uh, and then I think this is a good point to bring up design, and I'll get back to the whole life thing uh, in a second here uh, to answer some questions. Um, when it comes to design, it's always about the big forms, and that's the uh, I think the thing I kind of left out about using markers because it does let you have these ginormous forms uh, on paper, uh, so you could evaluate your designs uh, similar to when we use silhouettes. You know those black uh, shapes that we do uh, on paper. It's the same thing, you know, essentially, because you're just evaluating you any design from a big, big form point of view uh, without any kind of details to help you define it. Because if the form is good, nice and big, then the detail is very, very secondary. That's why when I'm inking this, uh, I'm not too stressed out. The, actually, the hardest part was the first about two minutes of this video uh, in which I'm using the marker to lay down the design. Because if you're having a kind of a bad day or a bad design day, uh, no matter what you put down with the marker, it uh, won't look silhouette-wise. So uh, fortunately on this one, it was kind of going pretty smoothly, but there are definitely times in which you, uh, no matter what technique you use, nothing comes out, uh, and that has nothing to do with details. And in fact, details would not fix any of that. So. All right, let me go back to some of the life uh, life questions that we had earlier uh, from the last video. And one of them, uh, which is a pretty big issue, uh, has to do with money. You know, how much money can you make in this industry? Now, I don't like to talk about this thing because, you know, obviously the generic answer would be like, you should be doing this because you like it, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. But we live in a real world. And in the real world, you have to pay bills and you have to, you know, feed your family and whatever. So you can't just choose something that you like to do. But yeah, you're going to be um, eating a couple noodles all day long. So, so yeah, so I actually talked to our students about that uh, as well here in the school is that we're pretty upfront about the kind of money you can make in this industry. Uh, now, the best way to put it is that any specialized industry uh, that requires a specific skill that's hard to acquire to get, you know, uh, serving uh, fries at McDonald's is not a skill that's hard to acquire. You know, you don't need too much of anything to do that job. However, if you want to be a doctor, you want to be a, a you know, a elite Navy SEAL, or you want to be a concept artist. Well, these kind of things require specialized training that could take years to do. And with any of these kind of jobs requires this kind of training always pays pretty well, uh, especially in countries that appreciate this kind of stuff. Uh, in, in our case, the concept scene, the United States is definitely where all of this is kind of taking place, uh, and that's filtering into Europe. And of course, then right now it's all over Asia, but the pay scale varies according to that uh, valuation of what you do. So the US is definitely the highest on the pay scale for concept art, of course, in Europe followed by Asia. So uh, most of these jobs for students, when you get out, you could probably easily make somewhere between 55 to about 75,000 
USD a year. I'm not sure what that is today because that's what I made when I first got out of school. So that is considered high, especially considering I was about uh, 19, I think, uh, when I first got out. And that's, that's why I was making it at age 19. So versus some of my friends who are going to uh, you know, universities for another four or five years when they first got out of school, they're making like 35000 So yeah, so this, this industry is uh, high pay. And to think about it because, um, and that's just beginning. I mean, I was 19. So once uh, you, you build yourself a name and uh, be pretty well in this industry, you can make as much as a surgeon out there, uh, a brain surgeon, for example, uh, or any any high, the highest doctor in a, in a hospital like USC or whatever it is. Uh, you know, the, and these guys are making uh, very, very good money, and you can save yourself into seven figures pretty easily uh, by doing this job. So, but you have to be good. You have to be in the upper food chain, the upper echelon, in which the you know most of the clients are your big shot companies, um, and they're paying you. And why would they pay Concept Guy that much? Because design is what makes these these products work. You know, films and um, and video games, a big part of them is the visual selling point. Uh, of course, video games have to be fun. You know, that's a big, big factor as well. But the visual thing draws the audience. You know, you can have a fun game, but if the visuals are not quite there, they'll still sell okay, but they'll definitely start going to the niche markets because, you know, the hardcore gamers will like it. But the, the general audience will look at the graphics and go, or the designs and go, hey, that's not that cool. So these, these days, video games invest a lot of money in the concept stage to make sure that their game and war film look very, very cool. And that's your job. That's what the concept guy does. And if you look at any of these companies, um, you know, look, let's name some like Activision, EA, or even the smaller companies like uh, Rocksteady and these, if they're putting a game on the shelf and this game is pretty high profile, then obviously these companies are multi-million dollar companies. I mean, some of them are, are in the multi-billion dollar industries. So when they're investing in a new IP, a new game, they're not going to go hire some high school kids and, and pay them high school money. It just makes no sense. Why would you invest something so big? and then put the lowest kind of cost into it. So for, for the design side, the concept guys are generally treated quite well uh, in terms of pay. So if you're good at this kind of job, you don't have to worry about money too much um, because in the beginning of most of these projects, you need about three kind of individuals to get a kick started. Uh, one is the um, director or producer, you know, the person that brings in the uh, essentially the money um, and the main idea. Two is the, the writer or the game designer in this case, uh, sometimes they're the same person. Uh, that kind of gives you the overall view of the world. But those two of them, you know, these two individuals are pretty in the idea, they need a third guy to now bring those ideas to, to visuals. So everyone else on the team or investors and whoever uh, else they need can see the project. And that's your job. That's a concept guy. So you're in this kind of very early stage, uh, tip of the spear type of teams. And, uh, you know, it, like any other industry, tip of the spear jobs tend to pay pretty high. So... But of course, again, it always goes back to your skills. You have to be very, very good. You can't expect to kind of do this uh, kind of amateurish and end up in those kind of food chain uh, pays. It's not, it's not going to work. So, but if you do invest your time, work very hard in school or you know self teaching, whatever you're doing, and get yourself to be very, very good, start to get hired by big studios, then money is not going to be a big deal, you know, for you. Um, again, depending on what studio you go to, but most studios I've worked for since I was 19 have been uh, quite, quite generous in terms of uh, pays and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff too much so um, you know I'm not gonna give you exact numbers of you know what what someone should make because that's up to you especially if you freelance um, if you want to make more money just take more jobs you know you, you might kill yourself doing it because freelance the clients don't know how many other projects you have as long as they get their deadline delivered uh, you could take three jobs and if each one uh, is paying you very good money you just do the math on that just time it by three four whatever you're taking and uh, yeah you can make yourself a good living uh, maybe kill yourself about six months and then take another half year off because you made plenty to uh, cover the entire year so that's all that's out there so yeah just work hard get get yourself into those studios get yourself into a you know a wanted position okay when the studio is coming after you you're going to be in a good situation right versus you out there trying to look for a job uh, for most professionals they don't do that the jobs come to them and if you're in that situation then obviously they want you to be on the project and obviously they're going to try to entice you and the biggest enticement uh, in, in the in the human side i guess is uh, in, in the industry side that is is money so yeah so hopefully that answers some of you guys questions uh, versus that um, so here I'm kind of showing you um, how I'm kind of just putting some uh, marker stuff, um, digital marker that is. Back in the days, this will be done with a, I'll probably use a 50% or 70% gray, uh, kind of do exactly what I'm done here. And then the white will be added with Prisma, uh, not uh, sorry, not Prisma, actually, yeah, the Prisma white uh, color pencil for some of the softer stuff. And then the little hot white highlights will be done with a uh, gouache, white gouache. So 
the cool thing about digital is that you could do a little bit of glowing effect, like the blue that I have in the cockpit. These are things that are pretty much impossible to do in the traditional days. You just couldn't get things to read like they're glowing on paper because you're already kind of working with a uh, soft value uh, medium. So, but in digital, yeah, you could really make things pop. It looks great. So, and that's it. You know, this is a good presentation level, I think, for early phase design. Now, these things could be pro into production already. Uh, if you're working with a three good uh, 3D artist that's very, very good at their job, they can actually take this draw and actually start running with it. Uh, they could probably figure out the back view, the front view, without you have to do any of the drawings. So here I'm kind of warming the drawings up. I, I think they look kind of cool in a warm tone versus a cool tone, and just put everybody on the page, and that's about it. So hopefully this episode helps you guys to see some of the traditional kind of ways of working, uh, make his way into digital, and back to the uh, Cintiq. Again, it's up to you, man. I don't recommend it if you're starting out, and that's my kind of final verdict on that tool. Uh, so hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys uh, hopefully in a few weeks with a new episode. Okay, and if you have questions, leave it in our comment section. So, all right, guys. So I'll see you guys uh, soon. Bye bye.